All right. Uh, good morning and welcome everyone to this meeting of the Committee of the Revision of the Penal Code, which is now in session. I am Mike Romano, committee chair. Thank you for everyone joining us today under the current circumstances. This is our first committee meeting of 2001. And um, it's really uh, an honor and pleasure to see everybody. Obviously, not only the extraordinary circumstances of the virus continue to impact our uh, operation, but you know, I, I don't wanna go without commenting just briefly on the events that have been happening in Washington and throughout the country. And I'm very proud that we've been able to continue our work um, and try to move things uh, forward despite um, a lot of other news and political events uh, going on in California and around the country. Um, so I do wanna mention, start at the top with a, a few folks, unfortunately, that will be, this is, will be leaving the committee. Um, as, far as first of all, as many of you know, I'm very sorry to report that two of our committee members will be leaving the committee following today's hearing. The first, as many of you know, is Dean Richardson has accepted a position as president of Colorado College in uh, Colorado Springs uh, and feels she can no longer contribute um, even remotely from Colorado, despite my, my pleading and urging. Um, I'm going to miss her dearly. I think I speak on behalf of everybody. She's been an inspiration. Um, she's been so kind, thoughtful, and generous. Um, I think her input has been invaluable, um, not just to this report and what we are do we've done this year, but I think, Dean, you've really set an excellent tone for us moving forward, and that's been an important part of this year's committee for me is to try to set a foundation um, that you know, is, is lasting and you've just, you've been, as far as I'm concerned, the perfect example oh. of that. Chair Romano, uh, thank you so much. And it has been such a pleasure to work with all of you. I'm really sad that I can't continue to do the important work uh, that we started here. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. I mean, I didn't give it to you, the governor did, but you're most welcome. And, uh, you know, I, as, I, as I warned you uh, when we spoke earlier, I promise to keep in touch with you and continue to badger you and pick, as, as busy as you may, you may be. Um, and it's gonna be very difficult to find a replacement with your you know, breadth of knowledge, expertise and wisdom. And, and truly, I'm gonna miss being in regular contact with you. The other person um, that will be leaving us is Senator John Burton. Uh, yesterday I received an uh, uh, email from Senator Burton, uh, which contained his resignation. Um, I want to say how much I've personally valued John's counsel and mentorship over the past year. As everybody and everybody knows, uh, he's one of a kind. And I also look forward to keeping in close contact with him uh, and President Richardson. Um, finally, I just need to recognize that neither resignation is at all a reflection of the committee's work. Uh, but about their ability to meaningful, meaningfully participate moving forward, especially in these times of remote communication during the pandemic. Uh, I'll be working with the governor and his staff to fill Senator Burton's position, Dean Richardson's, uh, with outstanding candidates as quickly as possible. Um, with that, I just wanted to take a quick roll call to begin our meeting in alphabetical order. Judge Espinoza. I'm here. Assemblymember Kamal Gadov. Here. Justice Moreno. Uh, here. Dean Richardson. Here. Senator Skinner. Here. Thank you all. Um, so here's, the here, here's today's agenda very quickly. First, we'll discuss uh, the report, the draft report, um, which is obviously our main event. Second, I'm going to give brief updates on the legislative work related to our report and recommendations. Uh, third, I will outline how we intend to approach our agenda for 2000 for this coming year. Uh, fourth, we'll have public comment related to the report. Uh, and finally, we'll conclude with a vote on whether or not to adopt the uh, report with uh, any suggestions, amendments, comments, et cetera. So let me uh, turn to the report. Um, so first of all, I just need to say how extraordinarily hard staff in particular, um, how much work went into this uh, report. We've never tried anything like this before. Obviously, this is an, our inaugural report. And um, throughout the process, I think that we've tried to dedicate ourselves to developing uh, reforms that were practical, that impacted a large number of people, and were based on empirical research, experience in other states, uh, evidence, and have um, 
broad support, if not unanimous support amongst uh, stakeholders. The report, as you know, covers 10 recommendations that span everything from traffic violations to life in prison. Um, it's, it's quite ambitious. Uh, and the report itself, I'm, I'm very proud of it. Tom uh, was obviously the sort of editor in chief, um, but also um, Rick and Laura and Natasha and Dan and others also, um, you know, lent a hand. So as you see, uh, the report is an elaboration on our 10 recommendations, which we adopted in December. They're supported with dozens of empirical reports, our own empirical data research, analysis from similar reforms in other states. The reform includes excerpts from our committee hearings and notes from our witnesses, from Governor Newsom to Obed Gonzalez, who you'll remember is in the middle of a 33 year sentence and testified from California Correctional Facility. The report also includes feedback and testimony we received from all of California's major law enforcement agencies, including the District Attorneys Association, Sheriff's Association, Police Chiefs, PORAC, the Prison Guards Union, CCPOA, and even Crime Victims United. We are still waiting on some final data that we are crunching, uh, particularly data from the Department of Motor Vehicles, um, some last minute data from CDCR, um, and uh, after we approve the report, uh, it will be professionally copy edited and graphic, and graphic design. So this is not the final format. Uh, the point of today is to see if there are any changes, substantive changes that the committee would like to make. Uh, with the understanding that I will have, as chair, will have final discretion over adding citations, adding further quotes from our meetings, updating the data and other minor non-substantive changes. So with that um, introduction, I was wondering if people have questions, comments, concerns about the report or any specific substantive sections you'd like to address as a group. Are we gonna go through one by one or you wanna just to pick out particular areas for a discussion? It would be to go to single out uh, areas of discussion, try to keep it to the area of discussion that one person raises at a time and assume that if nobody comment, has any comment about a specific section, no. that we okay. uh, skip over that. So it doesn't yeah. need to be in any particular order. It's just in orders of concerns that uh, any of you may have. Okay, I'll, I'll wait then until we get to, uh, I believe it's a recommendation number four. That's, that's the, no, I'm sorry, number five. That is uh, striking enhancements. Does anybody have anything to say before we get to striking in here? Or should we just, we don't need to take them in order, as I said. Yeah. Okay. Right, why don't we go? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think my concern that I, my concern that I raised, uh, I think at the last meeting was on uh, overcoming the presumption of uh, probation and uh, what the standard of review for would, would be for that. Uh, you know, I've given that some thought. I think at the last uh, meeting, I thought that the uh, convincing standard to overcome the presumption was a bit stringent. Uh, and uh, at least at that time, I was thinking that, you know, just a preponderance of the evidence would be sufficient for a judge to, to overcome a presumption in the interest of public safety. Uh, I'm still in my mind, you know, trying to come to a decision uh, on that. And I just wondered if, if anyone else on the commission had concerns about, about that. I um, mean, the question is pure presumptions. And although a, a judge is not required uh, to, uh, to strike an enhancement, uh, there is a presumption. I'm just wondering what kind of language a judge would have to use to not follow the presumption uh, as the report currently reads, it states you would have to be convinced by clear and convincing evidence, which is, I think, the second most stringent uh, standard to be met. Uh, so I, I, I would, you know, I'm kind of on the fence on that. I just wondered if other commissioners had thoughts on that. What page of the report? Oh, yeah, it's uh, page 38. Okay, hold on a minute. Page 38 and... 40 and 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 the staff member did cite at footnote 208 
that uh, acknowledges that clear and convincing is a high one, but it's been used in the penal code and other, other sections. I, I, I agree with your sentiment. I don't know if we need to add. I mean, we are, this is not requirements. So I don't know if we need to add number two. It's, it could be sufficient just to, it's establishing um, because they obviously are still, we are still allowing for judicial discretion. So I'm not sure if we even need a number two. Right. And I mean, and in all practicality and maybe Judge Espinosa who's, who's been in the trial court for actually more years than me. I mean, a, a judge can uh, you know, given certain evidence can, by articulating the standard, I think really justify uh, what the judge decides, whether it's by preponderance or clear and convincing or some other standard. So I, I kind of wonder, do we need to put in clear and convincing or should we put in, not say anything or just say by uh, preponderance of the evidence, uh, the judge can overcome a presumption. So apologies, Mike, I should have raised my hand. I'm trying to look at the document while still looking at Zoom oh, so I didn't yeah. go down we'll, to we'll the try chat. To multitask here, exactly. Um, yeah. um, I, no, I think I actually misspoke because I, yeah. given that these presumptions are not requirements, yeah. I think that is why we need to communicate that they need to have a- A good reason. Yes. A so good reason to I, I the twisted it in my mind. So yeah. from that point of view, I think that number two is good and that a lower standard, in a way, standards are, as you know, since it is not a requirement, it, but mm -hmm. making a, using the lower standard, the preponderance, is a kind of more wishy-washy and the uh and the way we've worded number two at least communicates very clearly that we really that in adopting this we really feel that those should prevail those bullet points under one should prevail mm -hmm. except under this circumstance Eden richardson did you have a comment that you wanted to say um i i did before senator skinner uh changed what she said the first time. So I, yeah, I, I, right. I, <laughs> <laughs> I had reversed things in my mind, Mike. Yeah, it's, well, it is, you have to think kind of abstractly because it is when you're right. rebutting a presumption that you have to like shift your thinking. Right, so I, I, I'll just sign on. I think I, I, I understand uh, Justice Moreno where, where you're coming from. I, I, I completely understand your, um, your hesitation and your concern, um, but for the reasons that Senator Skinner mentioned, I, I think we should leave it as is. As is. Yeah, uh, Judge Espinosa, I'm interested in your thoughts on this. Yeah, yes. I, was, I was afraid you would be. You so, give, you'll give me comfort. <laughs> yeah, I, I will just say that when you're a trial court judge and you're given you know, a, ra a rather strict standard, you're aware that the decision you made will be reviewed in light of that standard. Yeah. So um, I, I think that if we really are encouraging the legislature to make serious change to the way that sentence enhancements are filed and imposed that the stricter standard would be helpful, um, to be honest, Carlos, <clears throat> your honor. A, a stricter standard? Well, the clear and convincing. You'd really have to show by clear and convincing oh. evidence that, yeah. um, that you had a good reason. Right, because we are talking about public safety. That was the, my main, my main uh, uh, concern. So I mean, to, to just draw this out, a judge would look at these uh, presumptions of uh, striking uh, an enhancement if the, if the criteria there, number five, were sufficient, like the offense is uh, nonviolent. It's not a requirement uh, that one or more of those be, be met. Uh, but if one of those is met, there's a presumption. Uh, and the court could say, well, notwithstanding that presumption, 
in the interest of public safety, I'm not going to strike the enhancement. I'm not going to strike it. And then would articulate by clear and convincing evidence why that is the case. Correct. I'm just trying to think the way a sentencing judge would go about it. So I think evidence, that's the process. Yeah. I, uh, I, would, add a, I would add a couple things. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I think that you're right, Justice Moreno, to focus on the public safety piece. Mm -hmm. I think that we all, some of us have concerns about very long um, enhancements, especially if they're not justified by public safety. So this would require that the enhancement would apply in these circumstances only when public safety really compels it. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I think that the daylight between uh, preponderance of the evidence yeah. and clear and convincing evidence, it's hard to find the cases that would fit in one category, but not the other, honestly, if yeah. a judge right. would find one or right. another. And of course they would be reviewed for abuse of discretion mm -hmm. under that standard, which if they recited the same, the correct words, I think that they would pretty much be uh, upheld. What I right. think is also is that several of these enhanced, several of the uh, recommendations here are ways that we feel that the legislature can uh, narrow uh, certain enhancements that were enacted by legis by uh, initiative mm -hmm. that we might think de deserve even further reform. But this mm -hmm. is really just trying to focus, in my opinion, on the public safety aspect of it and avoid the automatic hit of a 10, 20 or life sentence unless the judge is really convinced the public safety requires it. So uh, I support the current language. Okay. Yeah, I just I just wanted to highlight that, and I think I'm I'm okay with the uh, with the draft uh, after listening to to all of you and clarifying in my mind how this might be handled uh, by a trial judge. And as as you say, you know the gap between uh, preponderance, which is fifty plus one, and clear and convincing, which is around seventy five percent, maybe not beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, I think it's fine. And I think a judge uh, fully apprised of the circumstances can, can articulate the proper words to, to satisfy the standard. I think a judge who's genuinely concerned about public safety can still impose this. And that's the, that's the point. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay, that's, that's the only comment I had. Otherwise I'm in agreement with all the recommendations. Great. Are there other thoughts, comments, and and you know, keeping in mind that we've voted on the recommendations themselves, but I was, you know, the substance of the report, are there um, suggestions of things that might be? And again, please keep in mind that it hasn't been fully copy edited, so it's not we're not looking for line edits here, unless there are specific things that uh, jump out to you as being poorly articulated. Um, Senator. Yeah, I would, um, in general, I, I think our report is very good, though I do look forward to the public comment because we there may be some things that are raised during that that we may want to, uh, to look at. So I do welcome that public comment. Terrific. Any further thoughts, comments, suggestions? All right, um, here's what I'm gonna do, uh, just cause I wanna make sure that everybody's on board. Um, the headlines of these recommendations are obviously in some ways the public grabbing, um, although they are not um, the substance of the recommendation um, and they were not directly voted on. Um, they, we did our best to in headline fashion and you know, succinctly summarize each of the recommendations. And I want to make sure that we all felt comfortable uh, with at least the headlines of each of the recommendations. So let me just go through them really quickly to make sure that everyone feels comfortable. For recommendation number one, this is about uh, the traffic infractions. Reduce punishment for traffic misdemeanors. Okay, I'm gonna keep on going until people 
Uh, can you hold on one second, please? Apologies. Um, I think I'm on number two, is that right? Yes. Um, number two, require short prison sentences be served in jail. Okay. I, um, on that one, and it's all sort of how, how we uh, communicate it, I completely agree, but I think that what we were and I correct me if I'm wrong, but what we were talking about in that context was a um, uh, that obviously elsewhere in the report we recommend changes in various um, penal codes that would change the the whether the crimes considered or wobbler or such or change sentencing and all, um, but that here we were focused um, more or not only, but a lot we were focusing on those circumstance where someone is in jail and when they finally get their sentence, they then have a very short time left to serve. So yeah. it's kind of less about the, the sentence timing itself, right? Um, but more about just that time left, which you do say, but anyway, it's more that why um, why go through the administrative and other bureaucratic cost to transfer someone if they're going to be in for that short period of time? Correct. We're just trying to look for a way to frame it. And I know that you and I have spoken about the framing of these is super important. I mean, another way to say this would be um, reduce short prison stays instead of require short prison stays to be done and you know, flip it and say, <laughs> I think we can leave it. I think we can leave it as is. Um, but it's what this obviously is, is it, it, we're not changing a sentencing practice per se. It's more an uh, administrative type of thing, but that's okay. I think we- Correct. And where, and where they're staying, and this is obviously related to the budget as we've discussed, state budgets and county budgets. Uh, number three, uh, and mandatory minimums for nonviolent offenses. Number four, treat minor thefts without serious injury or use of deadly weapon as petty theft. Number five, provide guidance for judges considering sentence enhancements, as we've talked about. Six, limit gang enhancements to the most dangerous offenses. Seven, apply repealed sentence enhancements retroactively. Eight, equalize credits between custody settings and time of incarceration. That's a little wonky, but I think people will understand it, especially those who care about it. Right. Michael, I have a question about that, and yes. I, I probably should know the answer. We're, we're comparing and contrasting sentencing credits between state prison and county jail in this recommendation. And state hospitals. Ah, that was my question. Great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that came out, and this is the reason why we have these uh, hearings, is that we, we, had, we had identified that there were different credits between uh, jail and prison. What we hadn't until we dug into it some more was that actually, if you are sent to a state hospital to be restored to competency, you get no credit. Right. Uh, whereas if you had been in county jail waiting your trial, you would have received a lot of credit for that time. Uh, and I think that we agree that that seemed completely unfair and actually discriminated against people just because they were incompetent to stand trial, which seems really problematic. Um, so that's what's good. So it's, it's a bit of a, wonky uh, headline, let's say, 
but uh, it, the concept is actually quite simple. Credit should be the same for the same people across the board where they're, wherever they're being confined. Does that make sure. sense, Judge Espinoza? Yes, thank you. It does, and I think, uh, I think that even if they did satisfy their sentence, you know, with those credits, I think if I'm not mistaken, they could still be uh, detained until they were found to be competent. competent. Although at that point, uh, I'm not sure what the answer would be. Uh, I, I don't think they would be released, but maybe someone could correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that the competent, if you can't be restored within competency within three years, regardless of what your charge is, you you're are committed. Yeah. committed. You're, you're released and then you could be put on some sort of conservatorship. Right. The issue here would be if you've been charged with a crime, you've been found incompetent to stand trial, you sent to the state hospital for a year. After a year, they found you, okay, now you're competent to stand right. trial. Now you come to trial and found guilty. Had you been waiting in county jail for that year, mm -hmm. you would have gotten credit for all that right. time while you were waiting for your trial. Yeah. And depending on what your crime was, your credits would be different. You get zero, but if you, because you were found incompetent to stand trial um, and sent to the state hospital for that year, you get zero credits. Yeah. So you start off with zero, whereas the person who has the same exact crime, same exact criminal history, but been waiting in county jail, they get, excuse me, 20% um, off or 30% off or 50% off, depending on what the crime right. yeah. would be. Um, and here's just to merely say, apples to apples, regardless of where you happen to be housed. Right. Yeah, but I guess the, the critical thing is, uh, as you say, you'd have to institute a civil proceeding if they were uh, still required to be in custody for some mental ill capacity or public safety. Sure, that, that's, that's, that's a completely, nice. different, different, that's a completely different circumstance altogether. Yeah. We're talking about once you've been restored to competency and then you will become criminally sentenced. Yeah. Right to jail or prison, that you get credit for that time that you were being restored to competency. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, number nine is harmonize and clarify the parole standards. This has to do with the fact that the parole standards and regulations are all slightly off from one another. Right. And finally, number 10, um, is uh, increased second look sentencing, and this relates to Penal Code 1170D. Um, all right, I, although we can't vote on the report right now because we haven't had for per public comment, um, and uh, with appreciation that Senator Skinner wants to hear from the public before she has a, a final say, does anybody have any other thoughts or suggestions to the report before moving on with our agenda? All right, I'll give you all one last uh, opportunity to chime in after we hear from public comment. So I'm moving on to the second point of our agenda, which, which is um, the legislative uh, updates with regard to the report. As you all know, we uh, passed our recommendations in December. And uh, even since then, a uh, number of legislators have picked up on various aspects of the report. Uh, we remain in close contact with the governor's office to ensure that our proposals align with his vision and agenda. Um, we believe that there are six bills uh, in the legislature that contain ideas from the report. Um, so that's six out of 10 and things haven't even, we haven't even finalized our report. Um, obviously we support these ideas and you know, hope that they uh, get carried through. Um, staff and I will continue to monitor that legislation and work with stakeholders from across the spectrum and lawmakers to help explain our proposals uh, and priorities. I'll continue to keep you posted as uh, these ideas move their way through the legislature. Item three on our agenda is to, I want to give you some thoughts and my insights, some, of, some insight to my thinking for our agenda for 2021. Um, I would like to reserve our meeting in February to discuss that agenda, but I, so I don't want to set any agenda today. Um, I hope between now and February, um, you all can begin to think about uh, priorities that we should try to focus on. Um, we've heard a lot of information this past year that we couldn't incorporate into our report. Um, 
And although this year's recommendations span from traffic infractions to life in prison, there was sort of a, um, uh, a theme that ran throughout, which is you know, the length of incarceration or punishment for each of these crimes. So it would be, I think it would be great if we could continue with having an umbrella theme with different ideas uh, that permeate through them. Uh, with that said, some of the ideas that I think have come up in various different ways that I think that we may want to address, again, committing ourselves to nothing, um, mental health issues, almost every committee hearing that we had that came up, it's a particularly vexing problem um, and maybe particularly well suited to something like our committee which has, much, which has more time to dig into the complexities of the issue. Um, expanding indeterminate sentencing, there was a lot of talk about the role of indeterminate sentencing in our system in that, first of all, 55% um, of people who are currently incarcerated in CDCRs face some kind of indeterminate sentence. But also I think, you know, going back to what Governor Brown had said during his keynote speech is that some of the problems in terms of mass incarceration in California can really be traced back to the determinate sentencing law. Um, so some further look at indeterminate sentencing that which might include which might require either a two-thirds vote or a, a ballot measure. A prosecutorial discretion, um, that, is, that came out a number of times. Um, it's, I think, been highlighted in particularly in Los Angeles with the new attorney down there um, and some of the constraints that he is facing. Reentry issues is something else that came up uh, a number of times. I know it's been particularly important to some of us on this panel. Um, and then, of course, and this came up many times during public comment, especially, but um, the issue of special circumstances, LWAP, and the death penalty. Yeah. So those are some of the issues. Again, committing ourselves to nothing. I just wanted to let you know some of transparently some of the things that I'm thinking about over the next couple of weeks. Once we get the report out, I'll, I'll turn to that. Um, please, uh, individually, if you would uh, think, speak with others about things that you think that would be especially well suited for the committee. That would be great to discuss in February. Also never hesitate to reach out to me or uh, committee staff. I, I just have a comment on the special circumstances uh, issue. Uh, it, it's always been uh, my view, particularly when I was on the Supreme Court and handled, I don't know, probably 200 death penalty cases, that there are too many special circumstances. There's something like 30 and there should probably only be like six or seven, you know, less than 10 for sure. So I think that's definitely an area for exploration. Well, certainly there was a lot of interest um, from public comment about this. Yeah. Um, obviously the governor has, you know, made his position on the death penalty pretty clear. Um, it's obviously a very hot button issue. It's also an issue that we intentionally avoided this year yeah. because it requires uh, a two thirds vote or, um, an initiative to really amend. Now, now that we've gotten had our one, uh, you know, year under our belt, the next ballot measure opportunities, 2021, to this this 2020, I mean, excuse me, 2022, mm -hmm. 2021 might be a good opportunity to explore some of those compared to other states, see how effective. Yeah. And again, um, so I, I I tend to agree, but I'm just this that's the reason why we didn't do it this this year. Yeah. Also. Okay an extraordinary complicated area of law. And for better or worse, um, as you said, you ruled on 200 death, death penalty cases. cases. Yeah. I mean, it, it absorbs an incredible amount of judicial resources, legal resources, right. legal power, legislative uh, for a relatively uh, small number of cases. It's yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, all right, well, that was some of my thinking. Continue to churn. And we'll discuss at our next meeting uh, in mid-February, and we'll send out um, scheduling notices to find out when the best time is for everyone. Um, all right. I'm going to, we've been going for less than 45 minutes, so I'm going to power through to do public comment, period. Um, so um, Today's public comment, I really wanna to try to make sure that uh, people's comments are uh, limited to the comments on the draft report, which was published on our website and distributed last week. 
Uh, we have a lot of work ahead uh, and many people who want to comment. So please keep your feedback on point and concise. Uh, depending on the number of people who sign up uh, in just a minute, I will tell you when. Uh, I will limit public comment to uh, one or two minutes. Um, before we get started, however, I'd like to recognize that we received very thoughtful and helpful public comment letters from California State Sheriff's Association, which um, we take very seriously and we actually appreciate, um, as well as comments organized by Decarcerate Sacramento and Californians United for Responsible Budget or CURB. So we've received those letters, we have read them, they are, feedback is important and will be helpful as we finalize the report. Okay, now's the time to get in line uh, for public comment. Please select the raise your hand function in Zoom. If you're calling in, you may hit pound, I mean, excuse me, star nine. Please note, of course, that this meeting is re being recorded and that if you make public comment, your name and or phone number may, may be displayed as part of the recording. Uh, I will leave a couple of minutes now. We have over hundred people in the audience. So um, please sign up now and uh, I will cut off the line in a, in a minute, but uh, please raise your hand and we'll take, um, in order of those who've raised their hand. All right, I'll give everybody one more minute if they'd like to sign up. All right, I'm gonna to ask Tom to close the queue if we can. It looks like we have 11 or 10 people who'd like to comment. Um, I'm gonna give everybody two minutes each. I really hope that you can please respect that time period. Um, we really do appreciate your feedback. We, will, we always are open to written feedback. If you have not raised your hand, you may always send email, or even if you have raised your hand, you may uh, also add to your comment through written feedback. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, start with uh, Crispy. Hi, thank you for all your hard work. I appreciate everything that you do. Um, I uh, am with Stop San Quentin Outbreak. I'm with Surge uh, at Sacred Heart Initiate Justice. And uh, for PRC recommendation number nine, clarify parole suitability standard to focus on risk of future violent or serious offenses. So I also am speaking for CURB. So CURB's response is that this recommendation does not address the urgent need for accountability and oversight over parole decisions. Despite the governing statute that directs the board, parole board to normally grant parole, the grant rate was only 16% in 2020. This is unlawful. Instead of giving parole commissioners more authority to decide who may be at risk of committing a serious or violent crime in the future, we ought to ensure that the board is held accountable both to the current law and to the people of California. I would also like to add um, that since you now no longer have two seats in the committee, would you kindly consider bringing people or, or consider asking the governor to recommend people who are system impacted to join this committee? Because I, I truly feel that those closest to the problem can really help solve the problem. Thank you and I appreciate everything you do. Thank you uh, for your comment. Um, I, 
I'm going to restrain from commenting too much. I mean, uh, we do appreciate some of the concerns that you've raised. I think that our, um, if you go back to look at our testimony, I think that, I mean, yeah, in our hearings on the parole standard, you see we wrestled with some of the very issues that you uh, mentioned. Um, Trina, Medina. Um, hello. Uh, hello, my name is Trina. I just like to offer my public support for the um, changes in emphasis on um, holding the board of parole hearings more accountable. Um, just like the previous speaker was saying, they don't seem to um, normally grant. And in fact, they look for any minor reason to deny parole, whether it be a, a nonviolent, non serious 115 from a year and a half to three years ago. Um, they they tend to not look at the current progress. And uh, so I just kind of wanted to offer my support in that direction. Is that it? Also, oh. um, also with the, um, the more weight being given to the CRAs, um, the guys or the people that have, have accomplished or have shown low CRAs um, have earned that. They've, they've worked hard to become that person that can show that kind of a psychological evaluation. And it definitely demonstrates rehabilitation and putting more weight on those. Um, I think it's also favorable. Well, thank you. Um, both of those suggestions are incorporated into our uh, recommendations. So uh, thank you for that. Yeah, so I'm just, um, I, I did read those in there. And like I said, I just wanted to offer my public support for those recommendations. And thank you guys for all the work that you're doing in, in, in these areas. We appreciate it. It's very important to me, as I know it is important to our next uh, public commenter. Uh, hello, Keith Watley. You're on mute. Good afternoon, Keith Watley from Uncommon Law. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, this, this country has long needed to reckon with its history of racism and white supremacy. But a week ago, we saw hordes of white people brazenly and violently attacked the U.S. Capitol, killing five and, and attacking many others. Sadly, but not surprisingly, too many of those people in that crowd were current and former members of the so-called law enforcement community. And they were both aided by other members of that community and supported by elected officials. This, this was a declaration of white supremacists that this is their country, not ours. Uh, and the way they were treated confirmed that too many people in authority share that view. Now, I'm not saying I wanted them all to be shot. I just know I would have been. And I know too that many people serving life sentences for doing far less than these folks who attacked the, the, the Capitol. Um, the disproportionate weight of our criminal legal system that is borne by people of color is fairly well known. For example, we know people of color are, are more likely to be arrested and held in custody pending trial. We know that 92% of people with gang enhancements in California are black or Latino. We know prosecutors are more likely to charge people of color with crimes carrying heavier sentences than whites. We know black men in California are incarcerated at 10 times the rate of white men. And nationally, nearly half the people serving life and life equivalent sentences are black. Now, given, given these findings as to other aspects of our criminal legal system, it would be completely surprising, shocking even, if there were no evidence of racial bias at the point of the discretionary parole decisions being made by our Board of Parole hearings. And in fact, there is such evidence. This committee is aware of at least one study finding racial bias in California parole decisions. The committee even heard evidence that the parole board has actively thwarted efforts to conduct a fuller study. Uh, I'll, I'll end with saying that the committee's decision to make no mention or recommendation regarding the role of race in discretionary parole decisions is a striking omission particularly in light of your recognition that some 55% of people in California prisons are subjected to this process. We have to reckon with this issue. That's, that's my point, we have to reckon with it. The committee should st strongly recommend that the parole board include race data in public disclosure of parole hearing outcomes. Thank you. So Keith, thank you uh, as always for your thoughtful comments. I, I just wanna say a, a few things. You're right that the parole recommendations do not specifically recommend that parole commissioners consider uh, race. That's not part of our recommendations. At the same time, I think that you'll see if you look at our report that every single one of our recommendations are made uh, with a primary, if not the primary, but certainly a primary focus on racial justice 
and trying our best, again, from uh, parole board decisions all the way down to traffic infractions to reduce uh, racism within the criminal legal system. Uh, the data that we have collected in this report, and admittedly not all of it is in the draft report, much of it will be published for the first time um, in terms of racial disparities throughout the system, not just in the parole context, but elsewhere. Um, and uh, it's been eye-opening even to those of us who have spent a considerable amount of time and are sensitive to these issues. The data is absolutely striking and absolutely appalling. Um, and it is difficult, as you well know, to ferret out racism anywhere, but particularly within the justice system. Uh, this is just our first year. And uh, we think that enacting our reforms, or I, I'm just gonna say, I think we'll make great strides um, towards um, making the system less racist, um, but nowhere nearly uh, enough. I appreciate that. Uh, Norma Nelson. Hello, can you hear me? I can. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all so much for the work that you're doing on this really important issue. I like to echo the previous caller regarding addressing uh, the racial injustices of our criminal justice system and the fact that uh, Black people are incarcerated at the highest rate of any demographic in California. And to the extent that you're able to address that uh, going forward, that would be greatly appreciated. Also with respect to the incarceration trends part of your report um, and in terms of a future scope, I wonder if you all had considered uh, looking at uh, the processing and housing of inmates at county jails, uh, <clears throat> given the fact that there has been uh, and continues to be a huge number of in custody deaths, uh, particularly at Santa Rita jail and um, around um, processing, people are supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. So if someone is brought into a county jail like Santa Rita and um, improperly classified uh, and put in a cell, for instance, with someone who is a known member of the Ku Klux Klan, a black man, um, there's something wrong with that system. And so I would hope that you would be able to at some point address uh, those types of issues as well uh, in terms of addressing the incarceration trends uh, related to in custody deaths of black and brown people and people with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, we're a very, very sensitive to the racial dynamics. We chose this year to not focus on prison and jail conditions, although you'll see from some of our recommendations, I think recommendation number two, it does deal with some of the, oops, excuse me, um, dynamics between uh, jail and uh, prison sentences and, and how to deal with that. But uh, your point is very well taken. Uh, Marion Wickard. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for the hard work you're putting into this very much needed penal code change position. It's not an easy job. Enhancements do not increase public safety. The judges need to use their discretion to remove and identify those who truly are low risk and have earned releases. I suggest that your committee support Gascon, DA Gascon's directive as he really has some great ideas out there. And I fully support restorative justice. And I have come to many of these meetings and truly, truly appreciate all you're doing. On a lighter note, uh, Michael, I'm very happy you got a dog from Lancaster Prison. I know many of the guys that work within that, <laughs> with the dog program there. And um, it's good to see that you've reached out at, and taken a dog from them. So I just want to thank you and the money that can be saved on housing prisoners can be used to help people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your shout out to my dog. I will shout out to uh, Jonathan Grobman, who is the founder of Pause for Life and started the dog program in uh, in Lancaster. And of course, he's, an, he's a walking example of the unnecessary uh, use of enhancements. He was sentenced, as you probably know, 
to 190 years to life for a nonviolent crime. And we're very glad that he's been able to be released through one of the second look mechanisms and with the help of the district attorney in Santa uh, Clara County. Uh, and we hope to find more folks and we hope to um, actually, I'm sorry, um, create a better mechanism so more folks like John who have been truly rehabilitated and are sentenced to extraordinarily long sentences have an opportunity uh, for a second look and to come back to court. So I'll use your compliment to Rollo to, to talk about John and his great success and he's doing really extraordinarily well. And I could, could not be prouder of him. Well, uh, thank you for that because my husband, Tommy Wickard and John are friends. Oh, good. <laughs> so, hey, we want Tommy out here to hang out with John. <laughs> Well, good, good, good luck to you. Um, Thank you. The next, the next person on the list is, um, I'm going to mispronounce this, um, Wittrogen. Yes, correct. Thank you. Very good. Um, thank you. First of all, I want to thank everyone for all the work you're doing. And it's it's very exciting to, to think of, of the actual potentials of change in the penal code. Um, I want to bring up uh, a subject that never gets raised and is something that I've been working with for 10 years and had the honor of, of working with Senator Skinner um, and others to, to end the practice of solitary confinement in which in 2015, we, we actually won our uh, class action lawsuit and about 1500 inmates were released to general population. Uh, during the time, uh, my husband was incarcerated for 21 years in Pelican Bay. And during that time, uh, the legislator, I believe in uh, the legislature, the legislators uh, took away credit earning time, shoe time, I believe in 2009, and it was restored in 2016. So as we're talking here about equalizing credits, this entire class was denied credit earning during all of that time. And many of these uh, inmates would have been released, including my husband, if he could have had that credit earning time. So I would like to just inject um, this poll aspect of the unconstitutionality of, of these men being held, men and women being held for 10, 30, 20, 30, 40 years and not having earned credit. And many of them now are, are much older. They have aged out. They've served the longest and most punitive sentences in the system, the most torturous. And I would like to see them be included in, in this consideration. And I will help however I can and work with you all however I can uh, I do st still speak for many of them. So thank you so very much. Thank you. I will just add that we do make a re recommendation that the um, credits that were um, instituted as a result of Proposition 57 should be applied retroactively if the credits are good prospectively and apply to people who are uh, being incarcerated today, they should just as well be applied to people uh, retroactively. I think it's just a matter of fairness and justice and public safety that all makes perfect sense. So uh, I would assume that would cover your husband's situation. Um, Ms. Danielle Sanchez. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Romano and members of the committee. Danielle Sanchez on behalf of the Chief Probation Officers of California. And on behalf of the probation chiefs, I just want to extend our appreciation uh, to you all for the opportunity to present at previous meetings and, and really to discuss the shared goals of keeping people out of the system, how to swiftly and successfully move people out of the system, and, and ultimately with the goal of creating sustainable community safety and, uh, and, and enhancing equity. Um, we also want to acknowledge the committee's focus on data and research to guide policy discussions, which is something that the probation profession strongly supports and uses to guide our practices and engagement on policy discussions, such as those being discussed here on alternatives to custody. With probation being the alternative to incarceration, the more we use probation as an alternative, uh, we need to look to continue to use that data to build in appropriate levels of accountability and rehabilitation with the goals towards sustainable safety. Um, I wanted to add, uh, I think importantly, you know, what is evident in both, both our firsthand experience and what data shows is that building skills and opportunities through rehabilitation leads to more durable and positive changes in public safety. Rehabilitation and public safety are on the same continuum. These goals are enhanced when both are accounted for and probation remains committed to working with our partners to connect our clients to services and supports to help them onto these uh, more positive pathways. Uh, 
Um, so we look forward to being part of the continued policy discussions, both on the recommendations um, in this report and, and future discussions as well. Again, we want to thank this committee, the staff, um, for allowing probation chiefs to be a part of these very, very important discussions. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I do want to say that um, we certainly recognize the important role of probation some of, and the data in particular. And I think one of our most important and robust reports showed that people um, who supported their uh, sentences on probation uh, were the most successful in terms of um, community safety and lack of recidivism, it's something that we definitely want to encourage and explore more. Not and uh, and and I didn't mention today, but I have at other meetings saying how important uh, data is to our work. We continue to pursue to collect and analyze data from across the system, not just to find alternatives to incarceration, but lengths of incarceration and um, other areas where data can be very very important to us. So we share that goal and thank you very much for all of your work and contributions. I think one of our very first meetings was with Porak, and so. Um, Thanks again for all your contributions, and, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Uh, Jane Corant. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, again, I want to uh, join the others who have thanked you for all the hard work, uh, all the great work you've done uh, on this committee. Um, but I do want to um, emphasize something that the first caller mentioned, which is uh, that we really need to see some impacted, directly impact, system impacted people on this committee. Um, last month, you uh, heard from an extraordinary panel um, of people uh, who have uh, suffered under uh, the circumstances that you are trying to remedy uh, in our prisons. And uh, I would urge you again to appeal to the governor um, uh, since you uh, have already included panels, uh, that we actually get a, at least a com one committee member who is system impacted. I know that may seem like a stretch, but I think it's something that would be very meaningful if all of you were, were behind uh, incorporating uh, uh, system impacted people. Uh, I also uh, would like to uh, highlight a couple of things I know that Curb responded to on um, numbers two and three. As someone um, who has uh, struggled uh, to reduce the funding uh, for our, uh, the, the county jails, um, I, I come from Contra Costa County and uh, I'm just concerned that um, pro recommendation two is uh, gonna result in increased funding um, when we really uh, are seeing counties suffering um, in that there isn't uh, sufficient funding for mental health. Uh, so uh, a stronger recommendation that looks at diversion and restorative justice, violence prevention, um, it seems to me that the realignment models are, are just going to increase uh, the sizes and uh, our, of our, of our um, county systems and take away from the mental health, the public health and all the other needs uh, that, that counties try to fulfill. Um, similarly, I'm concerned about number three, um, <clears throat> that uh, probation uh, itself, as Curb has pointed out, is a punitive model. And there are other models. Um, we, we hear of so many people who violate probation for really minor offenses, and yet that just keeps them in the system. So uh, I, I'm not sure that probation has really done anything to increase public safety, as, as Curb has pointed out. And there have been numerous studies on that. So um, the recommendation of allowing probation without any presumptions against it or, um, or mandatory jail conditions, um, they, re they really, um, that you really have to look at this more clearly. Anyway, thank you for listening and thank you again for all your work. And uh, I, uh, wish you well in the work that you do in the coming year. Thank you.
Mike uh, just called me, as you might see. He's having technical issues, so I'll, I'll just uh, get the next. Uh, we have a few more commenters, and he'll rejoin us when he can, just so everybody knows what's going on. So next we have uh, Mary M. Yes, hi. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for your hard work and dedication. Um, I just want to offer my suggestion, and I hope that you take into consider, um, consideration what was pre previously said regarding having, you know, system impacted people in your panel, um, Ms. Dean Richardson. Uh, we I wish you a great journey in your new um, in your new journey. Um, thank you very much for for serving this panel. And I just want to say that for agenda item number two, while I do agree that short sentences should be served in jail or prison, um, I I mean instead of prison, I think that. You know, this should, um, the main focus should actually be decarceration period, which I believe that this should be only in the event that all other alternatives has, have been exhausted and there is no other solution but incarceration. But I think we should first look at other methods instead of, you know, just jailing people and incarcerating them, um, such as, you know, community-based programs. Um, for agenda item, I forgot what that is, but I, I believe it's nine um, on the BPH. Um, I think that uh, the BPH should be held more accountable. I, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to articulate this um, so you guys could understand me, but I think that they should be held accountable uh, to take in consideration previous uh, reasons for denials that have been repeatedly challenged in the courts through the form of a habeas um, because there, there's, there's several reasons that have been constantly challenged in the courts and um, people have been granted new parole hearings because of these reasons. And I think they should consider, um, they should be held accountable for considering those um, reasons before making their decisions. And I also believe that when a new uh, parole hearing is granted, it should be um, conducted by a completely different uh, panel, which I don't believe it's the practice um, that they currently have in place right now. Uh, that's, that's my suggestions. And I really hope that you guys can consider those. And again, thank you very much for um, your hard work. Thank you, uh, Tom, I'm back, but I can't see the queue. Um, can you call the next person? Yep, absolutely. It's uh, Flower Alvarez Lopez. Hello, my name is Flower Alvarez Lopez, and I'm with the People's University in beautiful San Diego. I'm formerly incarcerated and the wife of a lifer at Pelican Bay State Prison. I want to thank you for the shift in the narrative around justice and the penal code and for allowing this conversation to happen. In regards to recommendation number six, the gang enhancement. Gang enhancements criminalize communities of color. I understand the idea of trying to target a population and demonize them as the bad ones. This divisiveness tactic is not new to us. These enhancements are discriminatory, discriminatory and if the people, if the purpose is to address public safety, then we need to address poverty. We need to address racism in our communities, especially communities of color. We need to address disparities but we need to eliminate racist gang enhancement. It is the era of change. Um, I hope you do reconsider reviewing that, that recommendation again. Um, on the recommendation number 10, I really look forward to the traction on allowing incarcerated peoples to trigger their own resentencing and advocating on their own behalf. This recommendation really does give me the most hope. Thank you. Uh Thank you very much. With regard to the gang enhancements really quickly, uh, the evidence that we're, we will present, I think for the first time ever, will show just how racist the gang enhancement law in California truly is. Um, and I think that uh, I, for one, would, would favor its, its, its complete repeal. Um, I don't wanna speak for other members of the committee, uh, but as, as we've said many times throughout these hearings is that because the gang enhancement was passed or major portions of it were passed as a result of a proposition um, and can only be amended by another proposition or two thirds vote that, the, that this committee is going to avoid those issues. 
So we decided to try to, um, I will agree, tinker around the edges of the gang enhancement uh, to amend those parts with, that would not require a two-thirds vote of the legislature. I share your, uh, bottom line is I share your concern about the uh, use of the gang enhancement in particular. Uh, I wish that there was more that we could do to eliminate the racial disparities, um, but uh, there's only so much absent a new uh, initiative, and which I also said is something that we may consider um, in this coming year, 2021, for the 2022 ballot. Uh, Tom, again, I can't see the queue. Hello? We can hear you, Nicole Gortares. Thank you, sorry. Uh, hi, my name is Nikki Gortares. Um, I was wanting to, I'm not sure if this has been mentioned yet or not, but as far as administrative determinants, um, particularly the VIO, um, it um, really hinders people from being able to really, you know, lower their levels, you know, increase credit earning, um, a lot of those things, um, you know, for instance, my fiance, you know, he's been violent free for almost nine years now and unable to, you know, really get any type of credit earning at all whatsoever. So um, that as far as, you know, it also defeats the whole purpose of rehabilitation, right? I mean, if you're saying, you know, that's for rehabilitation purposes, but you're not allowing the person to rehabilitate. Yes, so is, I assume that's the end of your comment. As I said, we really focused this year on trying our best to work on sentences on sentence lengths rather than prison conditions and rehabilitation programs within the custody. We do take a uh, opportunity to make recommendations about um, credit earnings and specifically that the 57 which uh, credit opportunities which are substantial are applied uh, retroactively um, despite the difficulties that that might have within CDCR. So I can't speak obviously to your fiance's position, but we definitely appreciate that credits are applied unfairly and inconsistently throughout the system, not just in CDCR for folks like your husband, but as we discussed earlier in state hospitals and jails, and it's extraordinarily complex and irrational. And I think a very ripe area for this committee to make sure that the credit systems uh, make sense, um, are transparent and are consistent. Um, again, I appreciate that doesn't touch your uh, fiance's situation necessarily, but it is not something that has escaped our uh, attention at all. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Tom? And this is our last commenter, Gina Schuler. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, thank you again to the panel for taking a look at all of these items. I would like to um, lend some equal support with having the system or having the panel have an impact, a system impacted person on the panel. I think it would be very, very important um, just to have that feedback and have that person who can, who's been there through life experience. I would also like to lend my support specifically to items nine and 10. Um, my husband has been incarcerated for 21 years. He was in Pelican Bay Shoe for eight years. He was part of the class action lawsuit and was finally released back to the main line in 2015. Um, since this has all happened on item 10, there have been many items that he could be looking at for resentencing that are not applied retroactively. So these men, especially these long-termers, people that were sentenced way outside of the scope of what it would be now, they're not even eligible at this time to go back and have their case looked at. Um, so I would really hope with the second look sentencing to have them be able to do that after a 15 year period. And then finally on item nine, um, I definitely think that we do need to have some more accountability and clarity, uh, and clarity on parole standards. It's not happening. There are men who have been RVR free for three years and more not getting found eligible. There, um, he became eligible for a youth offender parole hearing in 2016, had his meeting then. It took them till 2020 to give him his youth offender parole hearing. They canceled it because of COVID and didn't schedule it for almost 10 months. This is not okay and they need to be held accountable and make sure that everybody is being seen and treated fairly. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know a lot of people have raised concerns about system impact to people on the committee. First of all, obviously, we're committee members and we're not responsible for um, pointing people to the committee. Uh, I will also say, and I, I, I don't know everybody on the committee's personal history, but just because we're sitting here, does that necessarily mean that we're not system impacted in one way or another? They can safely say that we have never, uh, none of us have been sentenced to um, extraordinarily long terms in, st in state prison, I'll say that safely, and I appreciate that that's a very specific um, experience that may, that is, you know, very relevant to this conversation. And we've done, I think, better job than, I, I challenge any other organization or committee that has done a better job to incorporate those voices. But um, our experiences are not necessarily just our resumes. Um, I think that you would find that our experiences are a lot wider than you might imagine, including being crime victims and otherwise impacted by the system or had family members closely impacted by the system. So I just, you know, I, I do want to say, say that. Um, second, um, I think we also appreciate that the parole process in particular is another extremely ripe area of review for the committee, not the least of which is because the statutes themselves and the regulations are inconsistent with each other um, and really lack coherence and, um, you know, the direct um, statutory uh, guidance in establishing the committee is to, to find those areas of the law that really are inconsistent and irrational and try to uh, harmonize them. So it is a top priority for me personally um, that the uh, item number nine especially um, become law to try to bring some um, common sense and rationality and as you say accountability to the parole process. All right, I believe that uh, concludes our public comment period. Tom? One more person had raised um, a hand so. Okay, this this will be our last one. Renee uh, Benavidez. Hi, my name is Renee Benavidez with We Are Their Voices. And um, we're just as the families, we're grateful for this. This is huge, historic, like this is very emotional um, for all of us. But just real quickly on the enhancements, um, we were hoping that it was not just gang enhancements and it may not be, but that's all we were hearing about being discussed. And there's so many more enhancements that they can get from five years prior to this three strike, uh, any kind of strike. So I was just hoping that that would maybe be addressed if there's any other enhancements um, that you guys are looking into uh, to make retroactive. And again, thank you for all your work. We as the families appreciate you and you've given hope to us and most importantly to those on the inside. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just to clarify that our recommendations on enhancements apply to all enhancements, including three strikes. So they, they cut across everything. We do have a special recommendations regarding gang enhancements, but that's uh, something else all, all together. In terms of a judge's ability to strike strikes and strike enhancements, they apply gang enhancements, three strikes, all enhancements, um, and are really trying to focus on uh, public safety rather than just uh, punitiveness for punitiveness sake. Well, and Mike, I, I think um, Ms. Benavidez had mentioned retroactivity of some of the repeals. I think um, the recommendations for the retroactivity part are limited um, to just the one in the three years at this point. So not three strikes on the nickel price. That might be worth clarifying. Yes, that's true too. We have a separate recommendation that there's been two enhancements that were recently uh, eliminated by the legislature. Um, and we are recommending that those um, enhancements be made retroactively. They are not three strikes and gang enhancements, which are some of the biggest, most racially disproportionate and heaviest sentences, but taken together, the enhancements that we are recommending to go retroactively affect tens of thousands of people. They're extraordinarily common. And if enacted would save uh, tens of thousands of years, Tom, I don't know if we have the, the, the number yet, but tens of thousands of years of incarceration throughout California. So um, we think that that's very important and only fair, obviously, if you can't get the enhancement today, there's no reason why you should have gotten it yesterday. Um, all right, with that, I will close um, the uh, public comment section. Sorry, I'm working off of my phone, so I can only see a few of you. If you have comments, please speak up because I can only see four of you, three of you on my phone at the same time. Um, 
here's how I'd like to proceed um, as we close up today's um, hearing. Um, the, first of all, I really do have to comment uh, about Tom Nosowitz, who is our legal director. Um, from our very first hearing to shepherding and being the executive editor of our report, 90% of what we've done this year would not would just not be possible without Tom. And as you know, he's leaving on a well-earned paternity leave starting on Friday. Um, there's simply no way that we could have accomplished what we've done this year without his really tirelessness, his commitment to the committee, his good humor, his friendship. I'm gonna miss him. Um, I speak to him every day. Uh, I'm glad that he's getting to spend time with his family, which is, as I said, well-earned. His shoes will be uh, uh, filled ably, I'm sure, by Rick Owen. I expect a smooth and peaceful transfer of power. Um, and as much as I speak, with, look forward to uh, miss speaking with Tom every day. I'm, we'll be we'll be in cl close contact with Rick during his Tom's paternity leave. Um, so on behalf of the committee, I just want to send our very best to Tom, his wife Raha, and their growing family, and thank him for his uh, really extraordinary uh, work. Second, uh, before. Before we get to the report itself, uh, I'd love to have a motion and a second to approve minutes from our meeting on December 10th. Okay, I'm gonna see by the raised hands, although you guys are on mute. So moved, so moved. All right, is there, without objection, I will move um, our minutes from December 10th. Uh, I will approve the minutes from our December 10th meeting. Any objection? Okay, no objection. Uh, this is our final uh, bit of business for today. Um, uh, can I like a motion and a second to adopt the report subject to our uh, decision earlier, um, including the prerogative that I will have as chair to make non-substantive changes, approve the design um, and execute its publication uh, within before the end of uh, the month. Uh, Senator Skinner. Thank you. I, I um, am willing to make a motion, but I have a couple of hopefully minor changes that the committee would be supportive of that we could incorporate in the adoption. Please. And I want to say that in my, I would have, uh, I actually really appreciated the public comment because I feel like there were some things that were brought up that while we have discussed you know, in my focus on the report, I was looking at the details of the recommendations and not all of the text in the report. And I think there were some things raised that um, would be worthwhile for us to just slightly note in the report. And if you don't mind, uh, Chair Romano, I'd like to just um, list them quickly now. Sure, please. So on... In the very opening of the report, where we discuss our um, what were our objective and what we've done. So on page four, we reference our multiple meetings, how many witnesses. We don't reference that we had public comment at every meeting. So I'd like to include that because obviously it was in addition to our witnesses, the public comment <clears throat> did shape our. So I'd like to add that. Couldn't agree more. Great. And then page eight of that opening references, well, backing up, further into the report, we referenced that we opted to um, focus on those things that don't require two thirds vote or don't require um, a ballot measure. So I think it is worth it, for it while that's a paragraph in that opening, it's not referenced again. So someone could look at our recommendations and think that that's the, um, that's the final word from our perspective on those issues. And so I want to have some kind of, and I don't have a specific suggestion, but I would just recommend that we direct our staff to, to appropriately add any modifiers that our that um, these rec the recommendations, for example, on enhancements and in a couple of other sections, 
reflect recommendations that would not require either a two thirds vote or a ballot measure. So in other words, that it frames it, that they are not the collective thinking of the whole body on the ultimate disposition of those issues related to the penal code. Those are the two. Okay, sorry. Just wanted to make sure that I wasn't going far. Afield. No, I make sense. I'm, I'm taking notes, and then we'll discuss each or one of them. See okay, if great. great. And then in our recommendation number three, and apologies that I did not write the page number here. Mm -hmm. And this was brought out in the public comment, and I think we discussed it briefly. But where we say on probation. You know, don't just go to uh, incarceration. We recommend probation. I think it is worth it to include in there because we know that in uh, many of our courts now have diversionary courts, or many of our counties now have diversionary courts <clears throat> that we reference, that we say probation or alternative versus only probation because we know that in some places, depending on their diversionary court, they have used an alternative. So that's on that one. <clears throat> and then in the parole section, I think it would be worth it in our recommendation to say that we would recommend the, I'll say quarterly, uh, collect quarterly release of data that breaks down the um, pro board decisions and uh, actions based on um, a variety of data, gender, race, um, sentence type, because in a way, some of our um, discussion in the parole section was, you know, we didn't have we didn't have all the data that might have assisted us in, in a recommendation. And certainly we could recommend that there be some external re to study or something like that, but just the collection of that data and the, um, and the publishing of it uh, quarterly or the public making it public quarterly by the pro board would certainly help our process. So I wanted to add that one to that recommendation. And then on the um, enhancement section, the, the first recommendation is on basically any enhancement. And we say, you know, the enhancements have added a great deal to sentence time. If the second rec or recommendation thereafter is on gang enhancement. In the gang enhancement, we explicitly reference in the recommendation that it, according to the data, has a racial bias. Its application has had a racial bias. My recollection is that we also heard that the application of other enhancements had a racial bias. So given that we add that, that uh, mm -hmm. reference or phraseology in relationship to gang enhancement, I'd recommend that we additionally add it to the previous recommendation that covers all enhancements. Are those, uh, I wanna go through each one. That's Do it. other folks have uh, comments? Because I think we should sort of go through and address each one. Okay, because I can't see everybody, but I, I'll take it by the silence. And, so first of all, let's just start from the top and tell me, uh, Senator Skinner, if I miss anything. Adding an emphasis that we really uh, valued and heard from public comment at every one of our hearings. Does anybody have any objection to adding that to the report? No. I guess, I, I'm gonna say, uh, Senator Skinner, I think I agree with everything that you've recommended, but I just wanna make sure that there, everybody else is on board. Um, so that was, I think, easy one. Um, with regard to, um, emphasizing, this is the second point that you made, emphasizing that our recommendations are um, only require majority vote. That certainly applies to the enhancement period and the gang enhancements. Tom, can you chime in? Are there any of the other recommendations that um, touch on? I, those are the ones that occur to me. And I know 
I believe we referenced it in the gang enhancement section already that the reason it's sort of taking this approach is because of the initiative. Um, well, well, okay, let's let's add it. In, does, does anybody have any objection to also adding it to the a note somewhere to the enhancement portion? So then we, we put here in three places, the introduction that says that we're only taking on majority votes and that it covers everything. But in the particular of the ones that touch on the, the uh, areas that uh, initiatives are at play, which are the enhancements of the gang enhancements, that we add a note somewhere in that discussion that uh, this is no way reflecting um, or, our, our ultimate thinking or final thinking on this. Right. It's just that we've limited our reforms to where majority reform. Um, any objection to that? Senator Skinner, does that address your concern about that? Yeah. Okay. Number three. Um, in the discussion of probation, I agree with this as well. We had a long and I thought very difficult, uh, helpful conversation about diversion courts and collaborative courts. I think our ultimate conclusion was that it's very difficult to legislate those, yes. which is why we didn't include them as a formal recommendation. But I do think that we should probably reference them within the probation and say that many counties, and we heard from counties that are using creative uses of probation and diversion courts and collaborative courts, um, but that we ref that we refrained ourselves from making a specific recommendation about them because they're so hard to legislate. Um, I, I think that seems like a, a good idea. Right, Senator so Skinner, we could just include we could have that that reference that you're describing, but then in our recommendation to have say probation or alternative within the specific recommendation. Yeah, sure. Um, do people have objections or thoughts about that? Nope. Great. Uh, with regard to the parole and uh, releasing uh, uh, the data, um, we may get or have currently some of that data ourselves. Um, Tom, do you know what our data access is to the parole? We, we, we don't have anything from bits which is their system we, we we are from a different system i think it's something that we could move into but not obviously you know in time for the report or, or short order right well i think that senator skinner's suggestion was that they that the Releases. bph take it upon themselves so i think we, should, we it's the easiest place to collect it yeah so first of all i think that we should collect it ourselves yeah number one um and it, the data collection is a is a, is a top priority for for me, I assure you. Um, and I, I do think that we can also recommend within the parole discussion itself, as we should with everybody truly, and I think we do several times throughout the report, is that all of these agencies should be a lot more transparent with their data, uh, but particularly parole, I think is a, is a good area. So, um, and, and de de demographic. excuse me? Yeah, and of course it would be helpful to us in considering these things. I mean, I'm just thinking of, you know, while we are not, um, you know, we, we are independently evaluating everything that we have done so far in terms of reviewing the penal code. If we look at that, you know, what set us up in the first place, it's been the trends by, um, by the legislature, by the governor, et cetera, to, to making these various reforms. And when I think about recently that, for example, the governor just signed into law the Racial Justice Act, which has given new direction to the courts. Uh, the previous, I think two years prior, the uh, Governor Brown signed into law the data collection by law enforcement up and down the state of stocks by race. So it just, uh, it seems reasonable to get that kind of data from the parole board because it would help us in terms of evaluating in terms of our making our recommendations. Um, I could not agree more. Um, I really think that we are off to an excellent start. Um, I take this opportunity to thank um, some philanthropic partners, uh, Arnold Ventures and CZI that have uh, enabled us to start to ramp up and the California uh, Policy Institute that able to us to ramp up a really empirical analysis of a lot of this. I think that our next year, this coming year, um, our report uh, will be include an, a tremendous amount of um, original research along these areas that have just that's never been re released for various reasons. Um, and it's a top priority 
of my uh, of mine to really be transformative here. I think we have an opportunity to do that. And I think that we will. Um, so I couldn't agree more from parole to arrests, to driving, to the, we don't know what works. We don't know what doesn't work. Um, the, it's staggering. We do, we do not know what the average sentence in terms of time served is for any crime in California, from misdemeanors to um, life in prison. We don't know the racial breakdowns. We don't know the demographic breakdowns. We don't know the geographic breakdowns. We, 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 and, um, and, it's, and, and this is what's especially um, frustrating to me is that all this is of course public information, right? This is information that's in court and has been um, released in court, charging documents, sentencing documents, abstracts of judgment. Um, it's, it's numbers, it's a big data problem. And uh, I, I think that we're well positioned to, to tackle that. And I'm, I mean, partially this is my um, academic experience speaking here, but I think we have a tremendous opportunity here and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, encouraging these agencies, especially BPH and others to also do some of their own reporting um, is, a, is a first step. But um, I envision and hope that we will become a comprehensive resource for the state for um, a lot of this information eventually. Um, the last recommendation that you have, uh, Senator Skinner, was regard uh, emphasizing the racial di dynamic in uh, all enhancements. Tom, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that we mentioned uh, racial disparities in almost every single one of our recommendations, again, from the driving infractions all the way up to, uh, but do we have any uh, racial data, race data with regard to uh, the enhancement recommendation? So you're right, we mentioned it wherever we could if we had the data. And I think if we didn't mention it, it means we don't have the data. Um, so, you know, I, I was thinking as you were speaking, Senator Skinner, what we could do there. Um, we may be able to have some very high level information about the use of three strikes. Mike and I were actually talking about that earlier today. Um, we have some data that's old from 2016 on gun enhancements. And then we also are gonna have pretty good data on the repeal enhancements on the one and three year about demographics and county. But beyond that, and of course the gang enhancements, um, but beyond that, they're just, we're not in a position to really present that on the time frame for the re report yet. I think if we speak in six or eight weeks, it might be in a different spot, but um, you know, it's uh, just like Mike was saying, it's unfortunate that that stuff is sort of uh, not already out there and, and very available. So I think um, what I would say, we, we could add a few spotty things here and there, but not sort of um, a comprehensive. Uh, I, I don't want to reference it if it's inaccurate. I just, <laughs> this struck me that we were explicit in the reference in the opening of the recommendation regarding gang enhancements and silent in the language in the, in the, just the page that gives us our recommendation on overall enhancements. As to, go ahead, Tom. No, no, I, I was, I, I totally agree. And I think it just, I think it reflects. We lost Tom. Very robust up to date on it. Oh, so look, we lost you a little bit, Tom, there. Let me just say, know. first of all, with regard to the racial Sorry. disparity, it, it's most extraordinary. I mean, in the gang context. I mean, some of the data that we haven't even, the preliminary data that I've seen that we haven't yet been able to release yet is, I mean, truly hard to imagine a more racially disparate law in any context anywhere in America. Um, it's really, really ex extraordinary. Um, and of course, we appreciate that race pervades the entire system. Um, another thing that we can, and I think should do, is that we're not limited to publishing our reports once a year. If we get good data along the way um, on any of these things, we can release them. They don't need to be full-throated reports, but here's more data on, uh, on this particular issue. And I think that that will happen throughout the year, especially this year and next, as we get our data system uh, up and running. So um, for, unfortunately, within the next two weeks, uh, the data that we have is outside of the gang context on race. Um, we have very good data, I believe, on the um, race-based data on overall incarceration, of course, 
but even down to uh, traffic infractions. Um, so when we have good data, we do it. Tom and staff and I have been really, um, as you said, Senator Skinner, we want to present good data. Um, it's, it's, it's obviously, it's, it's quite easy to manipulate data in ways that, that may seem uh, politically advantaged. Um, and we are running all of the data analyses that we provide through our partners who are economists and sociologists to make sure that we're really presenting it in a, in a fair way. Um, before we before we publish it, so um, I hope that answers your question. Okay, so unless anybody else has anything else to say, uh, with the with the suggestions that Senator Skinner made, which are about the public comment, the um, modifiers about uh, majority votes, the Emphasis, the notations about diversion courts, alternatives to incarceration, collaborative courts. Number four, with regard to parole and encouraging um, quarterly release of demographic data. And number five, um, notations about disparate uh, racial impact, especially in the enhancement context. Um, I will make those additions. In addition, um, just uh, I, would like your uh, vote to allow me to make certain editorial decisions that are non-substantive, um, including adding data charts, um, proofreading and design, and uh, you're leaving that to me, and that we will then publish this report and deliver it to the uh, legislative leadership and the governor uh, before the end of the month. So with that said, um, I would move, uh, I, I asked somebody to make that motion and second it, and I hope that we can pass this committee report. I'm very proud of. I'll move it. I'll second. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, with any objection? All right, um, congratulations and thank you everyone. Um, so the, the committee uh, report with the following, with the modifications that I mentioned have, has been adopted. It's our inaugural report of this committee. Um, extraordinary amount of work went into it by all of us. We had so many, over 50 witnesses, dozens and dozens of hours of, 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 of testimony. We've all talked and worked so hard on this. Obviously, nobody wants this to be a, um, something that just goes on a shelf. Um, I very much hope that the legislature and governor take our recommendations seriously. And I, for one, remain very much um, available uh, to explain where we came from uh, and how the decisions that, that we made. I wanna work uh, as collaboratively as possible with our justice partners to make sure that, that this happens. And, I, and I, it's been an honor to work with you. Happy New Year to everyone. It's been such an incredibly incredible year. Dean Richardson, I'm going to miss you, but I promise to continue to bug you and stay in touch. Um, unless anybody else has anything to say, I'm going to bring this meeting to a close. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for uh, all the staff who have been amazing. Thank you. Thank you all. I will be in touch. Uh, none of, please know, you know, I'm always available. Uh, nobody hesitates to call, email, or text me if you need anything. All right, with, with that said, uh, this meeting Pleasure of the, to, the revisions of the penal code is uh, now closed. Thanks.